Welcome to Script Cover, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Chantry. And we are here for part two of a four-part series as we journey through William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, uh, an absolute classic. This was pages 94 through 183? 183, like I'll give you 183 for I sure. I know 183. Oh, um, yeah, right about there. Yeah, yeah right about there. All right. Uh, do, do you want to break down what we have going on here? Did you have one, or did you... Go ahead. I okay. know you uh, did it last so week, so... What we have here is... Addie Bundren is dead. I'm trying to remember where we, where we stopped and where we started. Yes. Addie Bundren is dead. Who, from who do we get that? From who do we get yeah. that? I don't know who says that. Darl says it. Darl okay. says it to Cash. Right. Or to, to Jewel. All right. Addie Bundren is dead. Has no way of knowing, but he knows it. So, Addie Bundren is dead. Jewel and... Um, Darl have returned from their $3 trip and they are now loading the mother. Uh, Cash finishes the box. The, it's off balance, but it's yeah. done. Uh, so Cash finishes that. We load Addie Bundren up and we start off. Unfortunately for Ants Bundren, as never was there a more unlucky man. The rains that had delayed all of the things to do up until then and really screwed cash in the making of the coffin have affected the entire country. Not the entire country country. The area. But the entire country as these people would have said country. Uh, everywhere around them is flooded. Yes. So they get to the bridge eventually after a couple stops um, and we have noted that maybe... Addie has started to smell. Maybe she has not. Someone has noted he thought he smelled her, but he was not sure. A little bit of a lingering odor. Um, as one might expect with a damp 105 degree dead body. <laughs> um, and they finally get to... Is it a river? Is it a stream? How does, how does it explain it's that? It's a river. It's a river. Toll's uh, Bridge. Toll's Bridge. The <clears throat> bridge on Toll's land is submerged in water. They're still going to try and cross the river. Does not go well. Absolutely not. We lose Cash's... Uh, first off, we lose the entire carriage. Yep. We drown the team. Yep. We nearly lose Jewel's horse. We nearly lose Cash. Darl half drowned. Um, simply trying to get Addie across the river. And that is where we've stopped. The only other revelation here is that... Do you want to... I would like you to explain Jewel. Jewel... We basically found out that Jewel is the illegitimate son of Addie. And I, I think he's a preacher of yeah. sorts? <laughs> Whitfield? Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, the, he's the godly man. Uh-huh. Interesting here. So, yeah. I'd like to start there a little bit, simply by the observation of these are such religious people, correct? Yes. But... Dewey Dell has a child out of wedlock. Yep. <clears throat> we get inferences that Jewel's out there screwing around. Yep. We thought Jewel was out there screwing around. Here, here's, here's the major... T well, so we've got, the, we've got um, Addie Bundren sleeping around and having a child out of her wedlock. Uh, extramarital. But the real telling thing to me was that when Cash was disappear or dang it, I, I keep doing that. When Jewel was disappearing, Cash and Darrell figured he was out having an affair. Yes. He wasn't just out having an affair, it was with a married woman. So, the thing that's telling about that situation is, not that that's the first place their mind goes, but that they're not surprised by it. Yes. It just seems to be one of the things, I got it, this is what he's doing. It's what he's doing. And uh, there's some interesting stuff going on here with religion. And uh, what is considered godly and the right thing to do. Uh, so much so that uh, Mr. Whitfield here basically goes to confess his sins. And then he finds out a lot of his already passes. Well, the Lord works in mysterious ways now, don't we? Time to hit that dusty trail. Well, but we also had a soul type revelation, didn't we? On the road to Damascus, he gets the vision from God. <laughs> this is what you've got to do. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't. Yes. But he was sort of relinquished of the sin anyway. 
simply because she didn't tell on him, and simply because you know God does work in mysterious ways. You know, you know I mean, you know, there's a lot going on right now. Maybe we'll come back to it. I, I, Interesting. Uh, if I can give you from page 176 here, old Addie herself. One day I was talking to Cora. She prayed for me because she believed I was blind to sin, wanting me to kneel and pray too. Because, pe because people to whom sin is just a matter of words, to them salvation is just words too. Hell of a quote. Let me drop that book there. Let me get that book drop going. Book drop. That is a hell of a quote. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, interesting. Very interesting. Because like given this area of the world and giving this time frame, uh, God is all. God is eternal. Uh, morality is a, the, the foundation of everything. Well, and we did discuss a little bit last week, not necessarily, not necessarily religiosity as much as being God-fearing. Yes. Right? I might not know the mind of God, so I'm just going to give it my best attempt, but if I screw up... And I mean, if we want to get even just base level here and say, you know... God punishes sinners. Well, it's a time to pay the toll. Well, so there's a little bit of other stuff. There's, there's a little bit more going on there. Okay. What is in religion the sign of cleanliness? The sign of cleanliness? Or, uh, symbolic for cleanliness. Uh, to be washed clean? I don't know. Take a dip in the river? Be baptized by the river? A lot of stuff going on there, especially yes. when does this rain start? I don't know off the top of my head. For right that as one Eddie Bundren is dying, right? Okay. Um, so we've got a lot of, so you've got you've got water. The the idea of hellfire and brimstone will pop up. Yes. Um, there's a lot going on with religion in general here. There this is such a layered novel that it is nearly impossible to get into everything, even in a read-along, for Christ's yes. sake. And, like, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Is like, we want to have a read-along as more of a reaction to what we're reading. Like, not trying to dig deep and save them for the review. But it's difficult in this. Because that river, you are right, is hugely symbolic in this in a number of ways. And you have characters who have these very traditional moral constructs. And they can't quite comprehend change, if that makes sense to you here. Uh, these things that are happening, the things that they're doing, they're basically going against these very traditional moral constructs that they've held dear. And they can't quite come to terms with what they've done with themselves. Very much like Whitfield saying, well, God works in mysterious ways, she's dead now, I don't have to confess to this sin. Right. Like Addie saying, well, I gave old aunts some good children, and then I had jewels, so I gave them two more. I did what I had to do. I, they can't seem to grasp. I don't know. So here, here's, here's the hell of it with this novel, and here's the hell of it with Faulkner, is Faulkner very much understood that people are fractured, and people okay. are fallible, and there's that goddamn cicada. Uh, I'm sure that's picking up on sound, but oh well. People being so fractured, people being so fallible, there's no way to live up to the standards of religion. Okay. So what people end up doing is they end up rationalizing not just their religion, but the things that happen to them. And from this, a type of religiosity grows, okay. right? That's what happens to Whitfield on the road. Um, he finds out that Addie Bundren is dead, so he is forgiven. Right. Okay. Um, you end up people end up rationalizing when they have these these big ideas of what is God, why is God, why are we, um, and then you have to you you come up with an answer, and oftentimes people come up with answers very early in life, such as with with ants. Boy, I had a heat stroke at twenty two, and I can't work since. Yeah. Right. So by twenty two, and really, if you're reading the text, we have to understand that the ants character came to this conclusion way before then. Um, and he does not give off any of the telltale signs of having had a heat stroke, right? He, he does not have facial paralysis or anything like that, okay. um, which, which happens sometimes. When you're talking about what would have been a life-altering event, you're going to have some carryover effect from that, not just, boy, I don't like to work. Um, but people rationalize, and this is what we're getting in this text, People rationalizing the things that they've done. Okay. Um, fair. 
just kind of backpedal a little bit, pause a little bit here. Because, like, we initially started out with saying, you know, we want this to be reactions to this. We don't want this to be hugely interpretive. Uh, and then we just dump right in. Because, I mean, it's good. It's good literature, and that's fun. Uh, let's just talk at a baseline here of what is going on to these people in this world. Uh, they've lost their team in the river. Yeah. They've lost their tools. One other thing yeah. I, I forgot to throw in at the beginning. Um, Cash broke his leg. Yes, Cash broke his leg. Uh, so we've injured Cash. We've almost lost Addy. We've lost the team. We've lost the cart. We're, yeah. We've lost the tools. We're trying to salvage the tools. We've almost lost multiple people to drowning. Uh, it just seems like, you know, when it rains, it pours. Things can't really get much worse now. And that smirk leads me to believe that I'm wrong in that. Uh, it's going to be a lot worse. But, uh, damn. Yeah. Uh, so last week, someone jumped in the comments and, and mentioned something about the broken leg. I would like to go back to that idea. Okay. I think that it is easy in today's world to forget the severity of yes. a broken leg. Yes. A broken leg can kill you. Yes. That is a very big bone. That is a very... It is a very traumatizing event that would break a leg. If you're lucky and it doesn't kill you, you also stand the consequence that this could put you out forever. Yeah. I mean, you lose your livelihood at this point. Right. There... You could Google... So, American football, right? There are high schoolers every year who lose legs to a broken leg. Mm -hmm. Um, There was an NFL player two years ago, stud... In college, drafted the NFL. He lost his leg because of a car accident, okay. but it still goes. It still goes to show you, someone muscled as heavily as an NFL running back, Isaiah Pede, can lose a leg in today's medical world. Yes, that's today. That is today. We're not talking about rural Mississippi, 1930s. Fair. Uh, And I believe there was even a point brought up when Cash breaks his leg. uh, They say, well, oh, thank God, it's at least the one he's already broken. (laughs) So if he is maimed and this is terrible, at least it's he's he's, he's He's used to the limp. He's used to the limp. He's still got a good one to go there. Uh, This is life-altering things that are happening to these people. And it seems like a simple thing. Oh, oh, you lost something in the river. You know, it was a bad day. You broke a leg. Uh, Cool. In today's world, you know, a bad day. Moving on. Go to the hospital. Get fixed up. These are life-altering events that are happening. Right. So one of the one of the things that really stands out, I think, when you read this text today is the severity of losing Cash's toolbox in the river. Today, okay. well, I'm going to go down to the five and dime, drop ten bucks, and get a hammer, and you know, not how things worked back then. Exactly. Those tools are gone. At livelihood is gone. Right. Um, and we we don't really even have anyone in the area from whom he can barter or bargain, right? He says that, uh, I can't remember which tool it was, he got it out of the catalog, <laughs> right? Uh, so he he went to lengths to get that. Yes. Um, another thing about this that I think, that I think merits description. Last time I said that Jewel was the guy who's fixing up the Camaro, right? Okay. The reason that metaphor stands true is the fact that the poor kid down the street doesn't have a Camaro, right? People in this world don't just have a horse. That's why the the team that they lost was mules. It was not a team of horses. Horses are expensive. Horses are dangerous. Horses are um, horses require a lot of training. In this bit of the book, I think that it stands. To give a different metaphor. Because what Jewel does when he decides to make this trip on that horse is extreme in and of itself. And it is symbolic. But it is extreme in the fact that it would not be... So... Not a Camaro. In this chap, in this portion of the book, that horse is a crotch rocket. Okay. Okay. Not a Harley. Not something with which people make the ride from all over the nation to Sturgis. This is a crotch rocket. Okay. We live in Kansas City, Dalton. I live in Kansas City. You live slightly outside of Kansas City. If I were to tell you that I am going to make the trek to Denver, Colorado 
on a crotch rocket, what would you say? Well, that's a stupid idea now, isn't it? A good luck. Mm-hmm. Right? Because this, this is very dangerous because that, that horse isn't particularly trained, is he? No. He's not particularly comfortable, is he? No. In fact, we even have a scene where, where Jewel is soothed saying the horse. And we get a little inference that horse doesn't give a damn. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, this is another metaphor for it is in this portion of the novel, that horse is a crotch rocket that we're making a drive a quarter of the way across the country on. There's a little bit of vanity going on with this as well here, which is a very much jewel thing to do. This isn't a working horse. This isn't a horse that's built for utility, a horse that's built for function. This is a nice horse. It looks pretty, that nice horse. And if you go out and you buy a brand new truck, you don't go that day and load it up with gravel and scratch it up. Right. So Jewel is very much showboating at this point. <sighs> My reading of Jewel is much more forgiving than many. Okay. Uh, I don't believe... I don't believe... So Jewel has always stood out like a sore thumb. All right. We even get from Darl the fact that he's always been a head taller than everybody. Okay. So this is a kid who is standing out in his own house, who it seems to be very picked on by ants, doesn't he? More so possibly than the other kids. And he's gone out and he's earned himself a horse. Yes. Now this isn't, this isn't a prize winning horse. These are horses that were all sold off at two dollars a pop. Okay. So even in even in this world, two dollars a pop for a horse was boy. That's discount shelf, yeah. right? That's bottom shelf stuff. Uh, that this is the old crow of the horse world. Uh, that is a whiskey reference. I hope someone gets that. But and and there's many reasons. First off, we get that the horse kind of looks funny. Yes. The horse is untrainable. We get a, the horse is wild, isn't he? A little bit. The horse is sort of a bastard, isn't he? Yep. Who does this horse sound a lot like? Sounds a lot like Jewel. Well, I'll be damned. And who is the one person in this novel who defended Jewel having that horse? Was it Darl? Addie. Oh, oh, okay. Addie yeah. was the one person who defended Jewel's idea of having this horse. Uh, the idea of having that bastard horse. When did she do that? When they're talking, when they first find out that Jewel's been working all this time to have the horse, she kind of comes to his defense when everybody else is attacking him for this. Does she? I believe she does. I she keeps saying his name. I'll have to go back and look into it, but I believe if anyone is defending him here, it's, oh, poor Jewel. Let Jewel be. Jewel's doing his own. And if you are going, because I at one point in time, didn't Ants dress up a bit for this trek? Put yeah. on his Sunday best? Yeah, he's got it on, yeah. What's Jewel doing? Putting on his Sunday best for Mama. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that's that's part of the reading that I give to this. Jewel seems to be... He's angry all the time here, right? Yes. And he snaps on his brothers in a heartbeat. Okay. But he's snapping on his brothers in a heartbeat in the name of... Um, in the name of dignity, almost, it seems, right? When they're getting ready to cross the bridge, Darl and Cash are saying, boy, I don't know what we're going to do. How are we going to do this? Okay. And Jewel comes up and says, move, you son of a bitch. We're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't give a damn what we do as long as we do something. Okay. And we talked a little bit uh, last week about, you know, how the difference in characters, how every character seemed to have their own very distinct personality in this. And that really comes through in the river. Cash is worried about that. Cash gets off balance. This isn't going to work. Ants really doesn't want to do this, but he's going to do it because that's what he's supposed to be doing. He's got to do it. Martyrman's standing over there like, well, my mother's a fish, but she didn't have to really swim away. So, like, it, Faulkner really highlights everything in this one event. Yeah. One thing goes wrong here, and every character comes to light. Every character reacts differently, as they should. And a lot is going on. Yeah. All in one small event. One small event that, if I will say from a reader's perspective, is a bit poorly written. Okay. Did you get a good visual on that? I, no. And I... I that's a good point, because did they use some kind of rope, uh, a ford? Uh, maybe I need to look into that a little bit better well, to kind of string themselves along? Or So what happened is the reason the boys have to cross... Se- th- there is apparently a part of the river which is crossable. Okay. And that is how Toll, Vardaman, 
Dewey Dell and Ann Scott across. Okay. But it was, it, the for, so the problem with it is that it's mud. So the minute you take the, the casket and the team on there, they're just going to sink. Okay. And this is to my reading. Perhaps I am wrong. So what they have to do is they have to take Addy across on the bridge, which is rickety, which is collapsing. Um, but the minute you get the, the, the wheels on the bridge, it's not going to sink in. Okay. Um, so that's how they have to cross. Okay. Uh, there's... Go on. Um, part of the reason it's... I found it to be poorly written, and I, I come up to this every time I read the novel, even though I know the answer, at no point when the, when the boys are crossing the bridge and the boys have nearly drowned and re-emerged from the water, do we get that they are across the river? No mm-hmm. point do I remember... Okay. At no point do I remember Toll and Ants and Dewey Dell and Vardaman crossing the river. I okay. remember that they are supposed to be doing that, but I don't remember it being shown to us. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and a lot of that, so Faulkner's not necessarily the best with writing action. Fair. So maybe that is me not getting it out of the text. Okay. If Faulkner's not great at writing action, though, symbolism... Faulkner and like just layering all kinds of stuff going on here is wonderful. Um, there's a wonderful little text called How to Read Literature Like a Professor. Uh, did you ever read that? I, I didn't read it. I have it. Okay. I know we bought it at the same time. Uh, and it goes through of key elements, very simple things, such as a river in a novel. If you see water or you see river in a novel, it usually symbolizes rebirth. Uh, you know, the rebirth into the Christian faith, emerging from the river baptized. Uh, just emerging in water in itself is a sin very washed away. sin washed away thing. The river in this is not rebirth. The river is death. And the river is a symbol of life because at this point in time you have to build close to that water. You want that water for your land, you need to be close to that water. That's always been a thing, all the way back. However, the river is definitely a, a more of a symbol of death here because that river is dangerous. That well, river is not bringing life, it's taking. I See, I think that Birth itself is dangerous. Yes. Right? Very for much both so. the child and the mother. And if we're talking in these chapters of birth, where we're talking about Jewel being born, we're talking about Dewey Dell being born, Dewey Dell is pregnant crossing the river, it's, it's a dangerous game. So I think that a little bit of what's going on there is we are quick to forget how dangerous life is. Fair. So death, I don't know that death is necessarily being invoked as much as rebirth because birth is dangerous. Um, and no one does die. Uh, we <laughs> cash is a little bit closer than I think we realize. Yes. Um, but it, so an- another thing that's going on here, when you look at religious texts and going further back, I, not to get Jordan Peterson on anyone, but religious texts were meant in order to convey ideas, um, lessons to be learned. There is oftentimes in religious texts the difference drawn between still water and moving water. Okay. Because it's okay to drink moving water. Yes. You don't drink still water. No. This family is themselves still, are they not? Okay. And the inference is made that Anne's Bundren never sweats. Okay. Sweat is in itself moving water. Very interesting. This family is still water. All right. I had a fun quote, but I, we're too far into this now. We're really breaking stuff down. I'm, I'm just going to let that one slide. Uh, well, but no, Adrian, no, bring it out, because I've got a lot of stuff to talk about. No, so. no, it was just it was a jab on myself and ants, because, hey, why not? I figured you'd enjoy it. <laughs> so, so you're not going to bring it out because I'd have it against you. Exactly. Uh, now, Adrian, there was something you said that would just blow my mind with this this week. That you would just uh, take me aback. I believe it might have been about Vardaman. Yes. The name Vardaman. I've never looked it up before. Okay. I've always wondered about it. I've never made the journey to look it up. Took it for granted, so tell me. James K. Vardaman was the governor of Mississippi. Okay. From 1904 to 1908. He was a good old-fashioned Southern Democrat. 
Right? He was known as the Great White Chief. Why, perhaps, might someone be known as the Great White Chief? Lay it on me. Racist things. Okay. <laughs> the thing that James K. Vardaman is most known for saying is, and I got this all from Wikipedia. Really? So, I mean, this is right out there. If it is necessary, every Negro in the state will be lynched. It will be done to mean, maintain white supremacy. Okay. Who does that tell us something about? Go on. Ants. Okay. Ants named this child. Now, the, apparently this guy was really popular with poor white folk, with the rural farmers, with people living off the land. And one of the things that was happening with racism at this time is that poor white folk were blaming blacks um, because all the things that blacks had done were things that the poor whites were able to do and they were obviously I mean this was obviously the case that okay. blacks were taking that work right that must be what's going on and that's why we're poor so a lot of a lot of I mean myriad reasons why racism was 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 deep and heavy back then but one of the things that happened is that people in ANSA's position used blacks being freed ironically as reasons why they have been generationally poor okay so naming your son after I mean, the governor from 1904 to 1908 is very specific. Yeah. That's so, especially when you're talking about something such as Mississippi, there's no way that is not the reference here. All right. There's no way that is not the reference with Vardaman's name. Um, and it, it tells us a lot about Ants because we don't get a lick of reason to believe that he is racist, do we? Not that I can think of. Except for this. Why don't we get that? There are no, there's no minorities in this novel. Okay. Right? So... Damn, Faulkner. Right. As long as we have a ghost on which to blame our poverty, we don't have to take responsibility for it, do we? Lazy way out. Because we can never even prove the ghost wrong. All right. So that is one of the... That is a very small thing that tells us a whole lot about this family, about ants in particular, that tells us a whole lot about so many things that are going on that I had not even looked into before this reading of the novel. Okay. That I saw that name Vardaman and figured, eh, it's probably somewhere in the Old Testament someplace, right? Figured it was a religious reference. All right. Because of these people. Lord. But no, his youngest son is named after the Governor of Mississippi from 1904 to 1908. All right. Someone that served one term as governor. Damn. Uh, that, that's a good thing to keep in mind for the rest of this reading. See right. if it maybe comes back in. So since we're talking about um, a bit of the bad history of the South, right? Okay. Let's get into something that I think is, and perhaps I'm wrong, I don't want to speak for every part of the country, but I think is sort of this Southern pride thing coming up in not necessarily a great way, but a positive leaning direction. On page 105 and 106, we get this from Ansa's perspective. I told him not to bring that horse out of respect for his dead maw, because it, would, it wouldn't look right, him prancing along on a darn circus animal and her wanting us all to be in the wagon with her that sprung from her flesh and blood. But we hadn't no more than passed Toll's Lane when Darrell begun to laugh, sitting back there on that plank seat with Cash, with his dead maw lying in her coffin at his feet, laughing. How many times I told him it's doing such things as that that makes folks talk about him, I don't know. 
I says I got some regard for what folks say about, says about my flesh and blood, even if you haven't, even if I have raised such a dern passel of boys. And when you fixes it so folks can say such about you, it's a reflection on your maw, I says, not me. I'm a man, and I can stand it. It's on your women folk, your ma and sister, that you should care for. And I turned back and I looked at him, sitting there laughing. I don't expect you to have no respect for me, I says. But your own ma, not cold in her coffin yet. This idea that the reason we have to be honorable is not for ourselves, is not for our father or brother's sake, but so that the women might not have to answer for us. All right. Is that, is that a uniquely Southern thing? Is that a Southern ideal? Is that part of the Southern pride thing? I guarantee you, if you take a journey down to rural Mississippi today, you would hear something like that. Okay. Um, I have always associated that with the Southern pride thing, right? That it's not, don't do it for you. Do it because your mama might be somewhere hanging her head in shame. I, it's definitely a trope of the South. It is. Right. Honestly, it is. Uh, and that seems to be that, that good old boy thing, you know. He's just a good young country boy, doesn't do wrong by his mother. Right. His mama, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, not mother. Not don't, mother. don't use mother, it's mama. His mama. Uh, interesting, interesting point there. That is a little something I, I picked up on, um, and it stands out to me. Because okay. I, I think that is something that does not by, that does not by location place this novel but by ideal places this novel, okay. which is something which is, that is always interesting to me to look at, right? Uh, the same as the name Vardaman. Yes. Uh, you're not saying we're in Mississippi, but by God, we're in Mississippi, aren't we? Um, and another, just a small thing in that quote, that when you're an attentive reader, when you're reading attentively, William Faulkner is so good at doing to you. Okay. I don't expect you to have no respect for me, I says. But with your own maw not cold in her coffin yet. It's, she's not going to get cold in that coffin. cold anytime soon. <laughs> that ain't happening. This is the middle of July. Yeah, it is literally the middle of July right now in yeah. Missouri. Yeah. A little further north, and it's 100 degrees out. Right. Fair. Uh, so that, that's one of those little things that... Faulkner's so good at putting little jabs in there that you don't notice in, until you're actually... Cause, not cold in her coffin. That's something people say. It is. It's true. It's true. It has no practical purpose. No. Right? Um, okay. Uh, did you want to talk a little bit about Darl? I, I think you did. Yes. So on 144, now I told you I told you to keep your eye open for spooky stuff with Darl. Which I purposely did not. This is perhaps the spookiest bit we have to this point with Darl. Um, about halfway down the page, we get this. He can swim, I say, in quotes. If he'll just give the horse time anyhow, and then we lead off, and we drop the quotes. And we have this, and this is from Darl's perspective. So we're in Darl's head. I believe. Let me, let me go back and check and make sure I'm... This is Darl. This is Darl, yeah. Um, Darl thinks... When he was born, he had a bad time of it. Ma would sit in the lamplight, holding him on a pillow on her lap. We would wake to find her so. There would be no sound from them. That pillow was longer than him, Cash says. He is leaning forward a little. I ought to come down last week and cited it. I ought to have done it. What we have there is Darl communicating this memory he has of baby Cash, of baby Jewel, right to Cash. Cash. Cash responds to his thought and then goes right back verbally to what they were talking about before. That is interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's a little bit of the spook there, isn't yeah, I'm gonna it? I'm going to give that a little mark there. Yeah. Because, uh... And it's, it, it is... So, another thing that Faulkner's doing there is it's so simple... To read over that, it and is. never catch it. Absolutely, I, I did. Very simply, very simple to read over that and never catch it. 
because we've got it so close to the we've got it so close to the, the quote, previous quote. and you do have some ellipses there that kind of just the quote just lingers off and then cash goes right back into talking about what they had talked about before and, and again this is your second time reading this and like i haven't even finished reading this yet this whole Darrell thing is a very interesting point and like it really merits like we should look into this more and like there has to be something written on it. Oh yeah, I, I, I guarantee it. I, I, I never looked into literature on As I Lay Dying, but I guarantee it. And so, if not, you should jump on this. I had heard at one point, I, I don't, I think this was from a professor um, that we had together, but literature on William Faulkner right now is outpacing literature on Shakespeare. Really? Yeah. Obviously, a lot of that is because Shakespeare has been written about since Shakespeare was written. True. Um, but a lot of it is also that Faulkner put so much in these things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, that's just, it's so gorgeous. And if you're reading along with us, I defy you to go back at that, look at it, and not get creeped out for yourself. Because what you did there is you you completely enveloped this it, one of the meta things that's going on there is that writing itself is a type of mental communication. Um, Stephen King in, I don't remember if it was On Writing or Dance Macabre, talks about this is telepathy. Writing is telepathy. Okay. I am communicating with you without ever saying a word to you. These are my thoughts that you're reading. You're, you're picking up on these strange little symbols that people over thousands of years, millions of years, millennia, generations, have um, finely tuned and crafted that don't actually mean anything. But when I put them on the page, you pick them up. Right. And that's my mind into your mind. What this is, is this is Darl's mind communicated on the page into Cash's mind with no break. So it's one of those strange little meta moments that that is in this novel. And god damn, that's so good. Like, you know when you go downstairs Christmas morning you were a kid and like it's so magical and you just, something's magic about it. Ladies and gentlemen, Adrian Ford's Christmas morning right yeah, now. Yeah, this is, I, um, I grew up without a family. Fair. Uh, I grew up on the streets. I, I grew up in uh, the gutters. Didn't have Christmas morning. This is how I found it. This is, this is it. with literature. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say on this? So I, we've definitely gone over a little bit here, but there was a lot to talk about. I got about. lots. Um, there is the word play on 175. What is the novel called? As I Lay Dying. Um, then on 175, we have, from Addie's perspective, we have a story from the dead woman. Then I would lay with ants again. I did not lie to him. We have that dichotomy between laying and lying. As I lay dying. I didn't lie dying. Okay. I would not lie to people, but I would lay with ants. But, in the biblical sense, we're getting the fact that during this time period, where she was with the religious man, she did not lay with ants, did she? She would not lie with him. All right. And she would never lie to him. Ants was just never quick enough to put it together and ask her, right? Um, so uh, I haven't done much with that. Uh, maybe I will get into a little bit more of that before we go to the review. Um, it's a very interesting chapter for Maddie. That right. very interesting chapter. There's a lot you can pull from that and a lot going on. Uh, and some damn good quotes in there, too. Yeah. I, I, I hope to put together a top ten quotes from okay. That'd be all right. As I Lay Dying, like I'm doing with the poetry readings, have them on with the, the voice underneath. Okay. Uh, the final real point that I have here is just something for, something for your mind to play with. When conceptualizing how revolutionary a mind William Faulkner was, this novel was written in the 30s. Let me, let me try to get a specific date. Um, I hate to do this live. 19, copyright 1930 by William Faulkner. This is before the PlayStation 4, right? Just a little bit. This is before the PlayStation 3? Just a little bit. Xbox One? A little bit. So this is a quote on 137 from Toll. So they finally got Ants to say what he wanted to do. 
and him and the gal and the boy got out of the wagon, but even before, they, before we were on the bridge, Ants kept on looking back, like he thought maybe, once he was out in the wagon, the whole thing would kind of blow up, and he would find himself back in yonder field again, and her laying up there in the house, waiting to die, and to, and it, and to do it all over again. It sounds a lot like a video game, doesn't it? It does. You it fail does. your mission, you start at the beginning, right? All right. Um, if, if you, so that's something that's very much in our minds, mm-hmm. that ability, you die, you start over again, right? And that's a good part of good literature, is if you can make it readable and you can connect it that through different generations. But where would that idea have come from in 1930? Uh, film? Early film? That didn't happen in film. I, I don't, I'm stretching here. Where would that idea have come from in 1930 that... You can screw it all up. It'll blow up. Not just you die, it blows up. Like a video game. You blow up in a video game and you yeah. start over at the beginning of the dream mission. Dream state? I... Even then, like normally in, in dreams, you're not blowing up and starting back True. at the beginning. You True. don't have to press select. You, Do you don't have, have to an insert answer two for that? Or? No, I have nothing. Okay. Like, I'm nothing. trying to stretch here. I'm like, I don't know what just, you're going with. It is, just, it, it, it is extremely interesting to me to put yourself back in that mind state of, it's 1930s, you know? From whence comes this idea of go ahead and fail and start over at the beginning. All right. You know, and it wasn't even start back over at the beginning. Start back over at the beginning of everything that was going on at the time. Um, her lying up there in the house waiting to die. Like, start over from that point. That's your last save. That, that's your last checkpoint. It, it's just... What is going on there? This guy was... This guy was so revolutionary but we're not even one of it is very easy to read Faulkner almost as a continuation of the literature that came before in defiance of the literature that was going to come this was the time period and I I hate to overplay Hemingway right Mm -hmm. but Hemingway was revolutionary okay Hemingway was a... It it is difficult to read this type of text and not say that this is William Faulkner saying, F you, Hemingway, I'm carrying on literature in the old tradition. Right? Okay. Um, Victorian text. This reads a lot more like Victorian text than it does Hemingway, doesn't it? And we talked a little bit. I, I don't remember if that was on camera or just you and I bickering about Hemingway and Faulkner and being very different writing styles. I don't remember if it was on camera or not either. But, but anyway, <laughs> we talked about it. We did. It's a conversation that I have with people whether or not they've read either author because okay. it's a conversation I like to have even if there's no one listening. Okay. Um, but it's hard to point to a text that is as traditional it's hard to call this traditionally written, but it is a little bit, isn't it? You, you've got the rhythms of writing in here that you find in Victorian type texts. Um, you've got the rhythms, you've got the, the long winded way of saying things that we okay. get before the Hemingway, for the four abrupt. words to a sentence, yeah. you know? Um, but it's so subversive and it's so F you. And it's so under the covers. I, this is quickly becoming my favorite novel. Okay. All so, right. So that, that, that's the last point I have. Well, breathe a little bit here. Calm down. But in, since you're in such a good mood now, and like you went off on your tirade, you enjoyed yourself here, uh, we trudged through Adjustment Day. Trudged. And it was awful. We never made the adjustment. And I didn't want to do anything. I just, I, I was over it and whatnot. And then we hit this. And like, I came back this week. I'm like, hey, I had trouble not reading ahead on this. Because like, I finished the reading early. I'm like, son of a bitch, I want to keep reading. May I give you ants? I notice how it takes a lazy man, a man that hates moving, to get set on moving once he does get started off. The same as he was set on saying still. Like, it ain't the moving he hates so much as the starting and the stopping. I just wanted to give that for you. Yeah. Figured I'd tickle your soul. That is the classic Ant's quote. Yeah. And I am actually really impressed with myself uh, for the stop 
points at this. It was good. It yeah. was good. All I did was the math on this. <laughs> and then I went to the, where does that chapter end that is exactly two-thirds of the way through the novel? You nailed it. Um, but if you like this sort of thing, we would appreciate it if you hit like. Uh, subscribe if you have not already. We are considering very heavily making more journeys through classics as we used to do uh, and completely writing off the new age. Um, you can also follow us on Bantam Paradox and Framerate. I will try to include links to those in the description below. And we hope to see you next time for part three, uh, which will be pages 184 through the conclusion of the novel. In the subsequent week, we will have a review of the novel As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. You're telling me. All right. Ooh.